John Pierre. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very, very, very happy to be here with you uh, to discuss uh, storytelling. Uh, uh, basically, I'll give a bit brief introduction of <laughs> and uh, what I do. Uh, basically, I come from Malta, which is a small island uh, 50 miles south of Sicily. Uh, I was always interested in uh, storytelling, especially, especially uh, because of our history, our rich history. And uh, I was always surprised why anyone doesn't know anything about this island, because I still find it fascinating. It has, uh, it has been invaded 14 times. Napoleon came over. It was a British colony for, for around 164 years. That's why we speak, we speak English, but it always fascinated me that no one uh, could uh, actually pinpoint where this, where this little island is, even though it, it has been uh, featured in, in many historical events, especially within Europe, and that have affected, that have affected uh, world events, including World War II, uh, El Alamein couldn't have happened without Malta. Uh, the invasion of Sicily couldn't have happened without Malta. Uh, in 1565, we were the first, uh, were, were the first nation to actually stop uh, the Ottoman, uh, the, the Ottomans. It was the first defeat that actually happened in Malta. So uh, storytelling for me was always extremely important. And I started uh, working in documentaries. Uh, I was a documentary filmmaker. Uh, specializing in history. Uh, I worked for the History Channel as well in the USA. Most of my films were shown uh, on all major major stations, but after some point I got bored uh, with uh, the kind of styles that television uh, wanted for, document, for, for history documentaries. So I decided to push uh, forward my career, go back to study, and start to analyze story from an academic perspective. And then I moved uh, to work uh, in the US as head of development for a small company, a small medium company. Uh, we do a number of projects like uh, Ben Hare, the television series, Papillon, uh, the recent movie done in 2017, until I was at a conference and they started, I, I heard Henry Jenkins talk about uh, convergence, convergence media. And I became fascinated with the subject. And I realized that, again, stories are changing. And uh, we, I, I felt that I needed to go back to study to learn how stories are changing. And uh, I decided to do a PhD in transmedia narratives. And from then on, I mean, I became completely fascinated in uh, in, uh, in this kind of storytelling, which is completely changing. and. I started advocating, especially in Europe, uh, doing a number of talks about uh, transmedia, uh, talking, talking to actual decision makers mostly, and companies trying to get them to understand how the audiences are changing and why we need to start thinking within those, within those terms, especially when nowadays stories are actually brands and brands become lifestyles. So if people, are, creators are not thinking in those terms, it will be very difficult to find an audience. So that was basically uh, my journey so far. Uh, I've worked as a producer. Uh, I finished my last film. It came out in the US uh, on most VODs. It's with Harvey Keitel and Milky McDowell called Blood on the Crown. Uh, it's again a historical film about uh, the bread riots in Malta in 1919. And, uh, Soon I will be announcing another another movie, which is an action film, and it's actually a transmedia story. So it is part film, part comic. And again, this is my link with comics. I was uh, I always loved them since I was a kid. I'm an avid collector of comics, and I also publish in Europe a few comics here and there, especially art books. Uh, I've published uh, Dave McKean, uh, Otto Schmidt. Uh, and 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 many and many others, and usually usually uh, what I do is I I publish limited editions for real collectors, so that 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 basically is the circle of of what I have been doing so far, 
but just to reassure you, uh, this is not going to be an academic talk. It's more my analysis of the observations of what I'm seeing uh, happening throughout uh, in, in this in these present times. It's more analysis of the present times, and I find these talks to be uh, extremely valuable for me, mostly because I get to be challenged by other people who are also storytellers in in their own right, and. Uh, when I usually start a talk, I always mention one story uh, because people are always afraid that uh, sometimes academics are a bit abstract in their thoughts. And I'm always reminded to be grounded by by a story. I don't know if you've ever watched the film by Akira Kurosawa called Yoimbo. Yes. Particularly the, the opening shot of Yoimbo is, uh, is uh, uh, the samurai walking in the middle of the road. And I, I believe there are 88 theses written about this opening shot. And some people are saying it is because Yoimbo is not afraid. So immediately the director is telling us and imposing on us that uh, uh, the samurai is afraid of nothing. So he will face any person coming, coming uh, from the other side. Other people said, no, he's terrified because there are bushes on the side and he's afraid that he will, that thieves will jump over and, and kill him or rob him or something like that. And uh, in the 1980s, there was a retrospective at the Venice Film Festival. I think, I believe Akira Kurosawa was already blind. And the journalist asked him, why did you shoot that shot like that? And Kurosawa answered, it was very simple, because if I moved the camera to the right, uh, there was a hotel. If I moved it to the left, there was uh, an airport. So the only way I could frame the thing is in the middle. So this story for me is always important because it gets me to understand that to be able to speak about storytelling, you also have to be involved in storytelling because most of the decisions taken uh, are not always an, an intellect, as an intellectual exercise. Sometimes it is a practical exercise that one needs to, need, needs to do. I guess that uh, everyone who is here is in love with stories. And I think... Uh, from experience, stories are the most important thing that we have because as they, they bind us together as nations. Uh, they remind us of our humanity. As Chesterton, as Chesterton says, uh, they not only tell us that dragons exist, but the dragons can be beaten. And this is why, this is why humanity has always, without knowing, given so much importance to, sto to stories. We have never uh, created anything that uh, is completely new, but we always keep referring back to the old mythologies that uh, that actually exist. I just remind you of one story. I don't know if you are familiar with the, with the legend of Gilgamesh, which is a story that, I, I mean, I'm fascinated about how, how Gilgamesh, how the story was discovered. Uh, in, in the late 1800s, uh, there was a British platoon uh, crossing over Mesopotamia, and they were on the on the road to to Ceylon. When a staff sergeant stopped because he needed to take a pee, uh, he moved to the side so that people can't see him. And in the sand where he peed, uh, the sand parted, and he found a column. Being British, and they can be quite anal, uh, he took the longitude and the latitude of that column, went to base camp and reported it back. The British, again, being anal again, went over there and started unco uncovering. Uh, and this was how the city of Nineveh was found, actually. And in this, in, uh, it took them 50 years to uncover everything. And they found the first written story, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And if you go just to see what the Epic of Gilgamesh was, it's very simple. It's uh, a village, is attacked by a monster. This monster, uh, needs to be defeated. So the king asks for uh, a hero and Gilgamesh comes, comes ahead. And in being in uh, being, he goes to the man on the mountain, he gives him weapons. He goes to the cave, finds the monster and kills him. If you just take those simple plot points, it is the exact same plot points of James Bond, the Dr. No, because there is an island, it is attacked. And my five, and my five um, operatives 
go to kill Dr. No, they are killed, they need a hero, James Bond, he goes to M, gives him weapons, goes to the cave, kills the monster, Dr. Who, Dr. No, who is completely deformed. So we keep telling the exact same stories because stories are things that we need. It's not like um, uh, people care much about philosophy, religion, or science because they all confuse us more, but stories are the things that actually bring some, uh, how, how shall I put it? They, they, they act, it actually brings us together and uh, helps us with the chaos of this world. So this is why they are extremely important. And the more I study about them, the more, the more I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. And while transmedia, as some people call it, this idea of telling stories, nomadic stories that move from one platform to another, uh, the, more, the, more, the more idea that uh, people think that it is new, the more I realize that it is not. Uh, as I told you, I come from a very Catholic country. And when I look at Catholicism, the way it spread, I see that they have used every single platform to tell the same story. If you go to church, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it seems, it seems like a game. There is a priest uh, dressed in a costume. People stand, sit, kneel accordingly. They are reenacting a ritual. But that same story is being told through music. We have sacred, sacred music, which can be beautiful, which is intended to continue a aiding your story. You have, you have statues, which are there meant, and paintings, which are there to help uh, expand the canvas of that story. And then you have plays as well. I mean, in, uh, in Easter time, in Malta especially, we, we tend to have all these processions uh, of people dressed as characters within the Bible so that we tell the story of the suffering of Christ because it is believed that through pain you can find, uh, you can find the truth, which is the same concept of every single myth, the hero's journey. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So when the more I study story, the more I said that it was always around us, we are not in reinventing the wheel. Everything is, 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 is here. But with every uh, different technology comes different behaviors. So in the beginning, when, uh, when the Gutenberg Press, for example, came about and books started to be printed, it took us 150 years to actually have the first novel, the first concept and, and, uh, and idea of a novel. But what the, what the power of the book was more about that I can stay alone, I can read on my own, I don't need someone to translate for me or someone to read for me, because by that time people were learning. And in, uh, in staying alone, I can reflect on things. And, the reflecting, and reflecting on things can be dangerous. And this is why uh, reading was considered for a long time in the Middle Ages as, as, a, dangerous, as, a, as a dangerous thing. With uh, the advancement of technology, even when we created the theater, there are certain rules within how you behave within a theater, whether it is for film, whether it is for plays, you still have a certain way on how to behave. With the invention of the remote control, again, there is, an, there is, a, there is a change in behavior that we are seeing people feeling that they are, that they are gods at this point. And with, inter, with the invention of the internet, now all of a sudden, it is, comp it, it is again a new, a new change where the, com the computer uh, basically can en encompass every, every platform because you can read on it, you can watch, you can listen. So it had all these things. So it is obvious that at one point we were going to go into um, a convergence of all, of all these, uh, the, this media. Now, what we have is that the entertainment industry is extremely slow in adapting things. And it is always, it is always, of course, because there is money involved, there is investment involved. And I always like to remember that when they took uh, huge investments in certain technologies that failed, people tend to be afraid. In the 1960s, I don't know if anyone remembers it, but I, I read extensively about it. They had created smell-o-vision which was you go and watch a film and you actually smell 
you have all these all these smells so that help you uh, increase the experience but in reality i mean it was a massive flop in the in the in the early 2000s there was uh, intrafilm i don't know if you remember about it where films were created and uh, once the main character has to take a decision, the film stops. People vote with who are watching who are watching the film, and depending on how they vote, the story continues. But the fact that they were uh, taking you out of the dream, switching on the light so that you can vote, the film stops. It just it just didn't work. So it is understandable why uh, the entertainment industry had had this problem with uh, with uh, with uh, actually jumping on board the concept of how can i create all these things all these platforms together and merge them and merge them as one but one has to re to remember that on the internet for example there are games where like people are investing as much as the gdp in the russian federation in a virtual world called called Norat, there are over half a million people every single day that are living, trading, and playing. And the GDP of this virtual world is the same as the Russian as the Russian Federation. And the concept of 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 transmedia or convergence is not new. The Japanese had been doing it since the 1970s. They used to call it media mix. And the idea of what the Japanese did was clever. It was just based on business. I start a manga, I read a manga, I buy 22 books of this manga, but the story doesn't end. But you have a million people, two million people hooked on your story. Once you finish the 22nd book, it just doesn't finish. You have to go and watch the animated version now. From the anime, you need to buy the playing cards. From the playing cards, then you go and see the film. So the Japanese were creating a template, uh, a very rudimentary template, of based on a business plan, and it it worked for it worked for some time. And I remember when I was growing up, I used to watch quite a lot of uh, Japanese anime, but I could always become very frustrated because I. I didn't have access to the manga, so I only got snippets of stories, but never got the full picture of it. And now it is it is it is different. It's something that I actually can can enjoy. And we in the West, the first time I think we came across the power of the media mix was through Pokemon, and that is what has changed everything. It 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 literally. Uh, has opened us up to to manga in such a massive way that if I'm, I, 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 what you have at the moment is that manga keeps selling more and more and more across all the world, and I think is the is the is the best selling, if we can call it a genre, of uh, of comics that that there are, and the reason, in my opinion, is that they have a more complete narrative, and while every single western world has no grand narrative we have no grand narrative to actually bind us together most of the most of most of the challenges have been uh, have been overcome already in the western world same as we are having in in japan i mean japan were a precursor of what we are going through and you are getting more and more people uh, falling in love with fictional characters or the fictional worlds wanting to be part of that fictional world so while the Japanese are actually offering the whole world, we in the West, we are still uh, quite backwards. You have, yes, a number of interesting projects like uh, Game of Thrones, the Harry, Harry Potter, that actually provide such a dense universe that you can enter into so many areas, into so many fields. Uh, but the Japanese were quite ahead and are, they have ready-made product from the 1970s that they can keep giving to 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 audiences now one thing that i always am fascinated when i'm looking at stories is looking at audiences and looking at their behaviors and as i was saying before of obviously with the advancement of technologies you always have different kinds of behavior 
and uh, any dressmaker who is preparing the best garment for a female, he must think of the body. He must think of the woman who is going to wear it. It is pointless saying, no, I just do stories for myself if I'm not looking at how also how my audience behaves and how my audience reacts. And I always think it is a mistake for many creators that, that I actually meet who always tell me, I don't care about the audience. I just want to do my own thing because I, they have this uh, concept that uh, either they're inspired by God and what they do is great. And uh, I think first and foremost, whatever we do is a craft. First you learn the craft and then you can create the art. And you, a, a craft doesn't live in, uh, in void. It, live, it lives within a context and context for me is the audience. Uh, one of the editors of Wired mentioned six verbs. Uh, Kevin Kelly, he had mentioned six verbs to, I, to describe how our audiences behave nowadays. And he says the, the, the verbs that he uses are screening, interacting, sharing, flowing, accessing, and generating. Now, why screening? If you look, if you look at how young people behave, they don't read anymore. They just screen things. Why? Because they have, first of all, they're bombarded with screens. They're, it's, it's a constant thing. You are, you, are, you are looking at your iPad, you are looking at your, your computer, your television, your mobile phone. So you are constantly hyperlinked, moving from one thing to another. And in many uh, news portals, even, they tell you this article takes two minutes to read, three minutes to read. And we are diluting the essence of even journalism because people don't read anymore. They just scan things or screen or screen things. The, the second one is interacting. We are constantly interacting with screens. Uh, I remember the scene in Minority Report, Stephen Spielberg Minority Report, where Tom Cruise's character is playing with a screen. And we thought at the time, I mean, when I was in the cinema, I thought it was uh, quite uh, so, some, something that is really science fiction and that maybe in my life I will not see it, but it is here. I mean, when I go and book, uh, when I want to buy a book from Amazon, the screen talks back to me because as soon as I log in, it tells me, hey, Jean-Pierre, these are the recommendations for you. So the screen is talking to me. It's acknowledging and noticing what I am doing and reflecting back, reflecting back to me. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie Brexit where they do an analysis of uh, Cambridge Analytica where they were actually manipulating uh, Facebook users so that uh, they manipulate the algorithm so that they can see only what they want them to see and have the articles that they want them to read. So this, this interaction is, uh, is, is constantly happening. The, the next thing is sharing. Uh, most of our audiences are constantly sharing things, stuff that they like. They appropriate uh, those things, make them theirs, and they actually are sharing constantly. It's not just the idea of memes. It's not just the idea of uh, uh, a joke here and there, but they're actually sharing also ideas that they that they care about, uh, concepts that they, if you look if you look at the Palestinian Israeli current Israeli Palestinian conflict at the moment, you start seeing on Facebook on my friends list who is. Uh, pro-Israel and who is pro-Palestine. So people are sharing also, also the, uh, their badge of, of allegiance to, to a certain degree. Uh, but this also happened through, probably you've seen it a number of times, uh, the television show called Survivor, which spawned the game called Spoiling, where people used to try to identify the location where they are filming use all, all the technology or possibilities that they have, including uh, there was one guy when they were doing the uh, Survivor Amazonia who actually moved a satellite just so that he can see who is going to be eliminated before the actual show airs. 
So as you go along, 11 million people were engaged in a game to try and solve uh, who won Survivor before the actual show aired. So all of a sudden, people are sharing their information with others. And this is extremely important because those people are in reality evangelists of whatever you create. The, the next verb he said is flowing. And this, the internet is a talent of information. There is so much information. Uh, it isn't like uh, in the 1980s where you would have a few things coming out. Now this is a constant, constant, constant. So as creators, we need to be aware uh, one of the competition and the talent of information that keeps coming to our audiences. So when we are creating something, we need to make sure that, look, it needs to be striking, it needs to attract, because otherwise we will miss, we will miss out because there is so much going on. Uh, another verb that he used is accessing. We have access towards, um, uh, towards everything. Uh, for example, in Malta, it's uh, very simple, in every square, you have access to the internet. So even if you are, if you are not, uh, if you don't have a contract, you can easily access from, uh, from, somewhere, from, from somewhere else. And uh, you are always online. I mean, people are connected all the time, talking all the time, accessing information all the time. And, and that's a reality of, of these audiences that we have. And the next thing that they do is that they are generating. Why, now, one of the things that uh, the internet is, is that it is a sort of a Marxist, or everyone is, is, uh, is in the same pot this, in, in, in reality. And people are just taking things and repurposing them for their own interests. Uh, we have seen so many examples. I mean, I don't know if any one of you follow the British show called Doctor Who. It had uh, finished in, uh, it was cancelled in 1989, but it was kept alive because of fans. So when it got picked up again in 2005, it was still alive in, uh, in uh, popular culture because people were writing fan fiction and posting it, uh, and posting it online. They had a place where they, actually, they can actually take stories uh, from their favorite characters and posting them online. <clears throat> there was also the, uh, a story of a friend of mine now, uh, a girl called Heather Lover. She was uh, 13 years old at the time when she decided to create the Daily Prophet from Harry Potter. And Warner Brothers took her to court because they said, that is my property. She won the court case. And it shows again that whatever we are creating does not belong to us because the generation that is coming up that is con constantly connected is a co-creator. And when you are creating a property into the world, you need to leave a space for co-creation because the audiences want that. Uh, there is also um, an example that comes to mind, uh, DJ Danger Mouse. He did the Grey album. He basically took stuff from Jay-Z's Black Album, Beatles' White Album, and created a new, a new fusion uh, of, uh, of music. And when he was taken a court, to court, is that, is that they were available, I fused them together and I created something new. So as, as uh, our audience is, is, is doing all these things that I had mentioned before, they, these new behaviors actually change our relationship with the audience. It is not anymore, I present to you my thing, but it is more, I present to you my thing, now take it and do and create something, create your own thing, be part of the brand. And lately I started doing uh, an intense study on uh, Japanese manga, uh, otaku and also the moe the concept of falling in love with a fictional character. And although this sounds like a, an, extre an, an extreme thing, the, it's also a reality, a reality of what we are seeing, that people want to be uh, so much involved in their fictional world that uh, they are creating bonds with it. And as creators, we need to be aware of those, uh, of those bonds that are being created. In fact, many people refer to audiences as loyals because they are the ones who would uh, do anything 
uh, for their own thing. Funnily enough, the first season of Game of Thrones was actually shot in Malta. And uh, I recently discovered there were, before COVID, of course, there were very successful tours of people wanting to see the locations of Game of Thrones. And my initial reaction was quite of a surprise, but as I analyzed it more, I realized uh, that it does make sense in the fact that we lack this grand narrative, we have to join another narrative. And usually it is this fictional narrative. And in being that, we want it to be part of our lifestyle. For us, it becomes extremely important. Uh, let it be part of who I am. So I will buy the T-shirt. Uh, I will buy the cap. I will learn Dothraki. I will speak like them. I want to go on the locations where it was shot so that I can see and I can compare. So it does it does make sense because it creates also different uh, revenue streams for uh, for creators, which are extremely important. So as we uh, as uh, the more I studied, the more I realized that uh, the relationship with the audience has changed drastically nowadays, and we have to we have to accept it and be aware that yes uh, in this case we need to we need to accept and allow them because no matter how much you fight your audience and you say this is mine the more they're going to do things uh, i read somewhere that like the internet is like the mythological beast of hydra the the monster with many heads if you cut one another one will grow in its place so it is much better to create something and allow this concept of co of co-creation. Now, in many producers nowadays, the way I see is they have a basic grasp that yes, people are looking at uh, all these uh, all these other platforms. And when I was growing up, there was a hierarchy in media. Film was at the top. Then there was novels, then there was television, games, comics was always at the, at the, at the, lowest, at the lowest rung. Young people going, growing up now are completely platform neutral. They don't have that hierarchy. If they love a comic and they start a story in a comic, it doesn't matter. They will move to, to the next stage. In fact, I'm, I'm always fascinated with the French that they never needed a name to, to call comics graphic novel. It was for them. It was always high art. The, 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 it was more an American thing that uh, the comics was of, of a lower rank. But uh, having having said that, we are seeing that for young people, if it is a game, if it is if it if it is a comic, if it is a film, it doesn't matter. As long as they are completely involved and integrated within the story, they will follow it. This is how young people are, are reacting. And what I, what I am discovering is that a number of producers nowadays remind me of the vaudeville acts. The vaudeville acts were extremely funny because uh, as long as you get an applause, it was enough. But they were not deep. They were quite superficial, superficial things based on a number of gags. And uh, most of the producers, especially when I'm giving talks around uh, around Europe. I realize that a lot of producers use gags to lock people in, while it would suffice a few years ago. I don't think that that is valid anymore. I think people are still looking for rich, dense mythology and real great stories. Now, when we come to talk about uh, uh, plot points. I mean, not much, much really has changed in this in in the world from the beginning. We keep retelling the same stories. Of course, there are academics that will tell you that there are only seven plots. Academics that will tell you that there are ten plots. Um, from my side, I think I think there are a number of uh, there are seven plots in 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 my mind, and everything can be can be uh, assessed within those within those plots, which is basically facing the monster. Uh, again, having been brought up in a Catholic country, the concept of facing the monster, Satan, was always there and there present in, in your mind. Dracula, 
who represented sexuality that he, uh, especially for Victorian times. So you always had the, you always had this this idea of the monster can be the shark in Jaws, whatever it is, aliens. Uh, that was that was one plot. Then there was uh, the internal voyage. Uh, the internal voyage is is the story about internal growth. This then you have uh, the external voyage where people need to go from one place to another, and of course that will also cause some change within 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 the characters. Uh, you have the tragedy and the comedy, uh, the Rex to Riches story, which is nowadays I think it's only romance. I didn't have something, and then I met someone, and 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 I and I I I. I had I, I had him or or had her, so, but if we have to analyze what stories are about, I always uh, re remember uh, a friend of mine and uh, who teaches at USC, David Howard, who always said, "How do we identify what is a good story?" And usually it is told in one sentence. It's about somebody who is having uh, a problem getting getting what he wants that is essentially what the story is so for me is if i have a story and i can't empathize with my character then there is a problem that somebody needs to have want something badly that something is difficult to obtain and that the story is told for maximum emotional impact it's pointless me hiding certain things i just need in, time, in, 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 in moments as well, so to manipulate an audience by giving a twist and turns, because I need, I need that max, maximum impact. And the last thing is that the story must have a satisfactory ending, because without uh, that satisfactory ending, the audience will leave uh, completely uh, dissatisfied, but also it will push back from, uh, from, what, is being, uh, from what is being created. Now, in in uh, creating transmedia uh, a transmedia story or, or a story of convergence, we are realizing that there are no craft people because you need more than one person to 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 build it. So again, in the same way, we are exactly in the stage when uh, cinema was starting. There were no screenwriters. People were taking uh, writers from uh, who used to write plays or novels and ask them to write a screenplay. And we are exactly in that stage nowadays where we are trying to find and scour for these people to try and create a transmedia teams. So it is an extremely exciting time in, uh, in my opinion, because hopefully in a few years time, we'll be able to see real strong transmedia projects. One of the few that I think uh, was intentionally a transmedia project and was extremely successful as The Matrix. The Matrix was not intended to be seen as Matrix 1, 2, and 3, the movies, but it was intended to play the game, uh, to watch the animated film, to read the comic. So it had all these components that actually uh, made the experience better because what we are talking about and nowadays is not about pretending or to create an experience, but actually giving uh, the experience to an audience. And this is, uh, this is quite a huge change in, uh, in, in how producers think, because we are learning a new craft and uh, dealing with uh, transmedia sometimes like uh, juggling uh, chainsaws and you need to try to make sense of it because every different platform has got its own production mode, has it's got its own problems, and not everyone has got the same skill set. But eventually, uh, we can get there. Now, my idea uh, to sort out the problems have always been to go back uh, to comics. I think comics are the best example to actually create anything that is transmedial. Why? Because it is fast to the market. You don't need to spend that much money as if it is a, as a film or, or a video game. And you can actually start building uh, your own fan base. And having your own fan base 
becomes uh, very important because those evangelists then will spread the word for you. So at the moment, one of the things that I am doing is uh, with together with a Canadian partner, we are actually uh, developing and uh, our our publishing house so that we start creating uh, a number of transmedia uh, projects starting with comics. So it, as we develop uh, the whole universe, we can start uh, creating one small story to take to the market in a fast manner. And with that, get already a form of engagement, a form of, uh, um, a form of uh, uh, debate uh, with our audience, because that is, that is extremely important. Now, uh, does anyone have any questions that they want to put forward? Uh, have yeah. you, I do, I do. Uh, have, to what extent have you looked at or considered uh, the uh, role-playing games, the tabletop role-playing game industry, which uh, at its best, engaged in transmedia, low level transmedia back in the 80s and 90s, um, but never really got the audience to succeed the way television and films have. Yeah, I, I personally, I used to play Dungeons and Dragons way back. And uh, I, in, in my current job, I have never, I have never, never uh, used it or tried or, or tried to use it. Uh, again, in creating anything that is transmedial, you need to build teams. You need to build teams of experts within that particular field. And it is never, never, never easy. In, it, it has to go with, with, with a, sense of edu a sense of education. Uh, I worked on, uh, on Hitman. I don't know if you ever played the video game. Uh, the, last, uh, the last game that came out uh, was uh, we published a graphic novel with it, which if you read the graphic novel, changes the game completely, changes the narrative of the game completely. And we were quite lucky because we sold 1.5 million units of the comic, which was in 2018, was a massive, was a, was a massive number. And we, we, we managed to, to sell to a different audience because our target were the gamers, not the actual comic people, because uh, a comic fan might not have played the game. So most of our marketing happened within the game itself. You buy the game, you download it, and you have an advert. And that translated to actual sales. So I think the, the secret to, to these things is always to work with uh, experts within that field. I, I personally, have never used it because I just was a, an occasional gamer, but I, I I wouldn't be able to know where to start. That's 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 the reality. Look, I, I would be happy to talk with you about that, but I don't want to take up this. Me, that's <laughs> that's my background. Is, is I worked okay. on Dungeons and Dragons and other games uh, back in the eighties and nineties and so on. Oh, cool! I mean, I I used to love it as a kid. Yeah, I used to, no, no. I used to really I, love it. I just, I, the, the, what you're talking about is so parallel to what the games do is create an experience, which we expected the audience to take. And then it was also brought into comics and into novels and into computer games. Um, so it's, it's a parallel to what you're talking about. So I was wondering if you had taken any of the things that had been learned through that and applied them into what's going. To, to, throughout my studies, I, I, I didn't use uh, role, role playing games because they were not the mainstream thing. I was I was more interested in 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 the mainstream. It was more accessible for me and and much easier to analyze. So when I was doing my my PhD, for example, uh, I analyzed a lot Ben Ten and how it operates, and I thought it was genius. The idea that a guy. Uh, becomes 10 different uh, then different heroes with all the bad guys all of a sudden you are selling those toys but as i was doing my analysis on uh, children who watched ben 10 so i was actually watching them watching ben 10 i was also noticing that they are 
playing as well as they are watching. And those toys are not just uh, the idea of having a collectible it becomes extremely important. And uh, having the, it becomes a portal into that world. It is not just uh, a piece of plastic, but it is much more. And this is why they treasure them, keep them, and they are collecting them. This idea of collecting, first of all, it comes from, from our, I think, ancestors that were always hunters and gatherers. But the concept of, of, of collecting is extremely powerful in kids. And I was talking with, uh, with a friend of mine who is a Spanish filmmaker. Uh, actually, he's a, he's, a, he's a designer and an animator. And he had a very successful show. In, uh, it started in October called Clanners. It was extremely successful till uh, November. And then he was expecting a boom because of toys. But somehow the television station uh, mistook the order and uh, they, got, uh, the, the, they got them shipped after Christmas. That lack of sales during the Christmas period resulted in lack of viewership come January. So you realize that all these things uh, are completely are completely together. And sometimes, may, you, I, I come across uh, I come across a number of uh, of of uh, people who are like I have a client of mine I can't mention who has the rights to a very popular book. And one of the problems is that they can't that they can't actually realize that if they want to succeed in today's market, they need to change their old methodology. And their old methodology is that they are not just selling a graphic novel. They are selling much more than a graphic novel. It's, it's, you, you are actually building a, building a fan base and engaging with it on a daily basis. One of my clients in Italy, uh, his name is Rossano Piccioni, he's, uh, he has this uh, small publishing house called it's Edizione in Chiostro. And he has uh, this book called The uh, Cannibal Family. And it's a story of cannibals who live in today's world and they have to survive in a normal world. They have to have jobs. They need to, uh, they need to go, the, the, the daughters are gonna need to go to school. They need to everything that normal people do, but they are cannibals. So then the story is about them trying not to be caught. And it is not uh, a comedy, it is not funny. Actually, it is inspired by the, by the 1960s Italian horrors. So it is very violent uh, for a mature audience. But the way he started engaging with the audience is incredible. He created a beer line. So basically he was selling red beer so people who go and buy this red beer are feeling part of this cannibal group. The pater familias of this family was in the army. So he started selling dog tags. He started selling knives, the cannibal knives. He made, and all these licensing deals helped over time to actually build this loyal fan base that now the, they sell every month 44,000 copies. That's a lot of that's a lot of comics, and it is his marketing, it is the marketing ideas that we are trying, that are building that fan base. I have a question. Yep. Um, you were talking about audience interaction and them working on it. Uh, what type of social media platforms have you explored, such as Discord and Slack, where fans get together and collaborate? No, I've I've tried I have tried everything. I have spent uh, up till four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, especially when I was with Hit on Hitman. The, the 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 issue with Hitman, for example, was that with every single new writer that came on the video game the canon changed. Then they sold the rights to Hollywood and the canon changed again. So the story kept changing. You, okay, you had a bald guy who kills people. That was the basis of every story, but the canon was changing. So when uh, we came in, we wanted to create the canon. 
So this is going to be the, the Bible that every single team is going to use from now on. And that is what we went to do. So who was the best to help you, if not the fans? So I used to spend whole nights debating with them, and they were informing me what is canon, what is not canon, and then we were evaluating with them. So I wouldn't say which uh, platform is the best. What I would say is go where the audience is. Hi, yes. Um, I have a question. Yep. Uh, what is an ideal way to start a story? Uh, how do you choose an angle? Oh, no, that's an impossible question to answer. Because it, it it varies for me. For me, I I usually look at the platform, and I say, okay, so who's going to be my audience within this platform? And then that starts to determine already the tonality of my story, the style that I'm going to use. If it's going to be graphic novel, the the artist that I'm going to use. Sometimes it is also based on uh, a marketing thing. For example, I know that uh, Otto Schmidt is very famous in Italy. I don't know if you are aware of this artist. Uh, he's Russian. And uh, when we were doing Cannibal Family, we started using him more and more for the covers. And it's, we're always putting his name up there just so that we can increase, uh, can increase sales. I know it's, it sounds a sleazy way of doing things, but sometimes you have to be practical because you are in a market and you have to sell. If you don't sell, you die. That's, that's the reality of, of, the, of, the, of any industry. It's, uh, it's, it's not just uh, a hobby. You need to, you need, you need, you need to sell. But I, I, to, to go back to your question, I always look at uh, the platforms. I think they're extremely important. And then I look at my audience. So what does my platform allow me to do? And then uh, how am I going to reach that audience and uh, speak, to, speak to that audience or speak to their desires? Any more questions? Oh, I have one, doctor. Um, so with a lot of the companies now acquiring so much property from different venues, is there gonna be more like in a risk aversion or are they just gonna keep burning through what they have until they need more? creatives no, I think I think I think what 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 is happening is especially with graphic novels uh, or or comics everyone is thinking now that's the gold mine let's go there and uh, dig up everything and buy it and then we'll see and that has always been uh, a tactic of many companies uh, that they are doing hopefully I think that uh, Netflix with acquiring Melar world, have done the first sensible sensible thing. I think it's a beautiful marriage of uh, a very talented person, Mark Millar, and, and his universe uh, with a very strong producing company, uh, even though they are a streamer, but most of, the, most of the things. So I think a lot will be based on that success because, because if that is successful, there will be other companies and other creators who will be selling directly to, to the streaming services. What we are seeing is a massive change of power, uh, having the both uh, HBO Max, uh, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, growing, growing in strength year, year after year, and they will be the dominating force. So they have the buying power to buy as many as they want. And they, to, for them to survive, they need to buy a lot of, a lot of properties. So there will always be a great need at the moment. I was looking at, um, on Facebook, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I was looking at some of your, um, what do you call them, um, movie previews. <laughs> um, and the one um, about, I think it was called Girl. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Okay, I can hear my volume. But anyway, it looks really, it was Aurora. Um, it looks really, really intense really good um i really want to watch the movie um is it available somewhere yes it is a, it is available on all uh, vod's on what did you say VOD? on all, all video on demand in in the u.s it oh, is, okay. 
It is. It is. Sorry. No, no, it is. It is available. I'm unfortunately, uh, I worked on three movies and then COVID started, so, so we had to, uh, we had to release them that way. Yeah, COVID kind of screwed up a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Well, I think that you're very brilliant. I'm so happy being just learning from you. Oh, thanks. But I, I learn from you guys as well. It's not the, it, 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 we are at a stage, I believe, uh, that we have to keep learning because things are changing so fast. I believe that you know everything at one point. I mean, we did three movies uh, and then COVID came, up, came about and everything changed. So the way you are going to market yourself, where you're going to find your audience, and you have to learn fast. I always say learn fast and fail fast yeah. so that you can change and pivot to what the goal you, you need. I agree with that. I had a, I had a coloring book, a hysterectomy, a coloring book for women who had a hysterectomy. And I was, you know, I kind of just put it up for fun and people were buying it. And, but as soon as COVID came, and I think that's, you know, because of the, the hospitals being full and everything. So um, anyway, yeah, no, it, it's changed my life for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing I miss the most, I think, are the the comic cons. Yeah, because they they are they are the best place to understand your audience. And I, I usually I usually attend a few in Europe, and I just go there to study how people behave. I like sitting at stand and just seeing how audiences are reacting to to. Things. I think that's so fascinating. And it gives you all this possibility to learn about them. Yeah. Hopefully things will get better soon. Right? Hopefully, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> Great. So anybody else? Um, yeah, I've got a question. Have have you had any surprise? What 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 surprised you the most in terms of uh, working with of dealing with fans and where it's taken you? With fans, I think it's, uh, okay, how shall I put it diplomatically? <laughs> there are some, some people who really take it overboard and I received insults, I received, uh, especially when I was working on Hitman. I mean, some people just took it because uh, we were being accused that, oh, you are again, just want to use our character so that you make money out of it. And I was saying, no, that's not the purpose of what we're trying to do. Yes, we want to make money, but our primary concern is let's build a canon, let's build a Bible, and let's create uh, a character who in the game has no personality and give him that personality. Mm. And you start getting all this uh, diffidence from fans at times, and they take it really a bit overboard. And I used to receive really rude messages and people threatening me and saying, it's just a story. But then, but then as I continued studying, I realized for them, it's not just a story. So I have to learn how to respect that as well. So if I want them to respect me, the, the thing I learned most is that I have to earn their respect as well. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I thought this was one of the most um, thought, my, sort of thoughtful, mind expanding uh, talks about storytelling and, and interacting with the market that I've, I've heard. Um, not that I've heard a lot, but anyway. Really thank thank you. Great. Anybody Good else? Job. Anybody else or? Yes, no. Okay, well with that, I'm sure that John Pierre wants what's left some time to have with, uh, some rest with what's left of his night. But anyway, thank you so much for a very insightful talk. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you have coming up next. I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. Where can I find your work? Uh, depend, depend, depends what. Like any type of work. He has an any type of work at the moment. At the moment, I have an um, I have a number of films on. Uh,
in the US. Uh, you can find them on iTunes or uh, or Amazon. There is Blunt on the Crown, Gerd, uh, Cage Fighter. All right, thank you. If uh, uh, j just just one thing, if uh, I mean I'm on Facebook, you can easily find me. And if anyone wants to send me your portfolio or something, I would be more than happy to see it. Uh, because I'm always looking for talented people so that I can collaborate and stuff. So just uh, send a message and we can talk. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, anyway, thank you everybody for coming. And just a reminder, if you want to, uh, our, and once again, for anybody who is interested, our drink and draw is next Thursday at 6.30. I'll be sending out all the information for that starting Monday. And again, if you have uh, anything for your, any comics or art that you want to share, just post it on the, uh, our Best of the Northwest thread on our Facebook uh, page, which I just posted the uh, link to yet again. But anyway, thank you again. And I hope everybody, thank you again, Jean-Pierre. And hope more than welcome. Thank you. And everybody have a great evening. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.